It's March 2023. Welcome to the Teens Cornerstone Connection lesson. In this series, we'll start off with lesson number nine, no laughing matter. Like seriously, it's not funny. With beautiful music from the orchestra, Asher on the tuba, Kiki on the trumpet, George on the saxophone, Kate on the piano, and myself on the clarinet. Grace will take us through inspiring mission stories from the Eastern Central African Division. And of course, our panelists, Marie, Jabari, Misati, Ashley, and our wonderful teen teachers. Enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Grace Washeke and I'll be taking you through the mission stories of this quarter. So here's a spoiler alert, all the stories in this quarter will be coming from the country of Rwanda. And before I get into today's mission story, let me tell you a few fun facts about Rwanda. Rwanda is 26,338 kilometers squared and this makes it the fourth smallest African country on the African mainland. The first three smallest countries being Gambia, Swaziland, and Djibouti. Rwanda has one of the youngest populations on Earth. Believe it or not, the average age is 19 years old. The third fact, popular sports in Rwanda are basketball, football, and volleyball. And cycling, even though it was considered a mode of transportation, is now becoming a popular sport. And our last fact for today, Subs subsistence agriculture is one of the, it's actually the main source of income for the Rwandese people. And their local staple foods are bananas, plantains, which they call ibitoke, sweet potatoes, beans, and cassava. And with no further ado, let's get into today's mission story. Today's mission story is about a boy named Claude. And unfortunately for this guy, he became a habitual drunk when he was just 12 years old. So you may be asking yourself just how did it get this way? This is because he grew up in a family drenched in conflict. His dad and mom were always fighting and the mom would many times fight with the mother-in-law and whenever this happened, she would go back to her home and spend time with her mother. Many times she would plead with her husband to move the family to another city but her husband always refused, saying that he didn't want to be far away from his kin. Now one day, the father, Claude's dad, fell ill, and he was taken to a nearby hospital, but after conducting tests on him, he was taken to a larger hospital since they weren't able to come up with any diagnosis. And when he was taken to this larger hospital and tests were conducted, they found out that he had malaria. He spent many days in the hospital, and he didn't really do well. Many people thought that he was actually going to die, but instead of him dying, he started acting weird instead. So his doctor took him to a psychiatric hospital, and then after quite a lot of treatment, he recovered, but the sad part about this is he was left deaf. So after going, you know, getting out of the hospital, he went home, but now instead of his neighbors, Rejoicing about his miraculous recovery, they started spreading rumors saying that maybe his wife had tried to poison him. This was the last straw for Claude's mother, so she decided to get a divorce. So she went back to her family and left Claude with his father. Then Claude's father sent him to his grandmother, and later on he remarried, and after that he sent for his son Claude to come back home. Now, because of all this conflict in his family, this had really scarred young Claude, and that's why at the very tender age of 12, he had become a habitual drunk. Now, one day after having quite a few drinks and being absolutely tipsy, he saw his neighbor boy walking down the street with a book, and this book was entitled The Great Controversy. But now the interesting thing about this book is that the binder had pictures of angels in white who were standing on the cover. Now, this really intrigued young Claude because he definitely knew what controversy meant. He knew it meant conflict, and he definitely knew what conflict meant. He'd seen it in his home a lot. So he wondered, 
how can a book about conflict have angels on the cover? He was intrigued. So he approached his friend and asked him, what's that book you're, what's that book? Can I know what it's all about? His friend looked at him and he saw that this guy is clearly drunk. So he did not mince his words. He drove straight to the point. He told him, if you repent, you will stand like these angels on the cover. You will be able to stand before God on the day of his return. Now this, this point hits home for young Claude and he instantly became sober. And then he asked his friend, he knew that he was a Seventh-day Adventist and he went to church on Saturdays, the Sabbath. So he asked him whether he could go to church with him. And his friend was so delighted and he immediately said yes. So Claude went to church that Sabbath. He loved it there. Everyone was so friendly. The kids wanted to become friends with him. The adults were super nice to him. So he decided to go for the next Sabbath, the next Sabbath, and the next, and the next. And he started to read his Bible. And since he didn't have any spiritual books of his own, he would borrow spiritual books from his friends. And he enjoyed reading them. Now, in one particular book, he read about a boy who wanted to witness to his friends about Jesus. So he asked his father, Dad, what can I do to spread God's word to others, to my friends in specific? So the dad told him, you can take some paper and write down your favorite memory verses on them and then give them to your friends. This Claude did immediately. And in the course of time, he, he did this for quite a while. And in the course of time, many of his, some of his friends started coming to church with him and later, four of them got baptized. What do you say to that? Right now, Claude is 15 years old. He's in high school now. And he still does that habit which he started once he accepted Christ. He still writes memory verses down on paper and gives them to everyone who may need one. And he says that he loves God and he sincerely thanks him for forgiving him of his sin. And that he will continue to spread his word as he gets himself ready for his return. What do you say to that? I hope you really enjoyed the story and right now let's get ready to listen to some music from our, lov from our lovely orchestra. And they're going to be doing song 601, Watchmen on the Walls of Zion.
Did you know it was not God's plan to destroy the city of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities that were found in the plains of Mamre? Welcome to today's lesson, Cornerstone Connections, brought to you by the Teens Class Nairobi Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And before I invite the panelists to introduce themselves, I would like to welcome Ms. Sati for the opening prayer. So let us bow down for a word of prayer. We thank you, mighty Father, for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy, and for your compassion. Mighty Lord, we come before you this day, and we seek that you may open our minds this Sabbath, that we may be able to draw closer to thee, Almighty Father. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. 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 So please introduce yourself. Let's start with you, Misati. As previously mentioned, my name is Misati Nyambani. Hey, love viewers. My name is Ashley. Happy Sabbath, and I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Happy Sabbath, viewers. My name is Marie. Happy Sabbath. My name is Jabari. Welcome to you, our viewers. My name is Bridget. Thank you all. And a happy Sabbath to our viewers. Happy Sabbath. We would like to ask you this morning, what do you know about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? So to start with myself, what I know about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is actually that the names were never preserved unto this day. In essence, the names are derived from two Hebrew words. That is Sdom and Amorah. Sdom to mean burnt and Amora to mean a ruined heap, thus indicating that which was done unto them. Sodom and Gomorrah was located at the south of the Dead Sea, now known as Mount Sodom. Okay. What else do we know about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? It was not only Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed. At least five other cities were also destroyed. Wow, thank you for that. And at the time, the cities were referred to as the cities of the Jordan Valley. The land was fertile and beautiful. Wow. Other than being fertile, the land also had beautiful, beautiful vegetation. Palm trees, olive trees, you name it. It was a beautiful land. And alongside that vegetation, the flowers give out very sweet fragrances all year round. Wow. So do we actually believe that God was interested in destroying this beautiful city with fertile land, filled with flocks? Would God really be interested in treating them so harshly and judging them so harshly? Well, today's biblical story is a cautionary narrative and tale that really tells us the dangers of, you know, um, setting your house next to those who will, you know, give you the bad advice. And it also just informs us that once, once that happens, then, then, you know, there are consequences to those decisions we make as humans. So we'll start with uh, Marie. Please take us through the first section of the lesson. So the first section is the what do you think section. And it states, a, a catastrophe was going to happen in your town. Rank the following warnings from which you would want to be given first priority. Which would you want to be given last priority? So I want my father and mother to be warned, my friends, my pets, my, someone to warn me. I want my city to be warned. I, personally, would like someone to warn me first. Then I could warn the rest. Okay. So um, what about the rest of us? What do we think? Well, I think that my parents would be warned already, so they'll warn me. <laughs> okay. What about you, Jabari? Uh, I'll have to think about that. You'd have to think about that. What about you, uh, Teacher Bridget? Uh, I definitely want my family members to be warned first. It would be so catastrophic to see them perish at, you know, at their own expense. Misati? So what I would do is I'd want someone to warn me first. Then I would take my pet. Then I would, I would take my pet with me. Since right. I think I can't talk to the pet, so let me just take my pet. Then I go warn my family, then my friends. Then maybe I say, city, you know, disaster is about to come. Okay. So uh, we want to now look at scripture and what it says. Marie, um, what scripture should we be looking at at this point? Um, we should look at 2 Chron Chronicles chapter 19, verse 10. I'll right. ask Mustafa to read that. Yeah, so 2 Chronicles 19, 10, and the word of God expressly speaks, in every case that comes before you from your people who live in the cities, whether bloodshed or other concerns of the law, 
commands, decrees, or regulations, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise, his wrath will come on you and your people. Do this, and you will not sin. Any other scripture? And yes, and teacher Bridget, would you read Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18? Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Thank you. So this tells us that it's our job to warn others, us and all of us, to warn each other. I'll give the example of when you catch someone doing something wrong. If you leave them to do that wrong thing instead of, let's say, telling on them or telling them out, then that, you're in the wrong. Yes, so that's very important. We can see throughout our uh, cautionary tale today about Lot, that there's a lot of warning that happened because it is not God's intention for you and I to be destroyed. So we want to thank even the teens today for um, joining us online today to do this, to ensure that we warn the world that indeed Christ is coming again. Therefore, we should prepare for his second coming and we do not get destroyed. We do not want to be amongst those in the destruction. Jabari, could you please give us a little more insight about this uh, cautionary tale? Okay, let's get into the story. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. Lot was seated at the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to the house of your servant. You can wash your feet and spend the night there and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square but he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet the men and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of, of my roof. Get out of our way, they answered. This, this fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge. He will treat you worse than them. They kept on bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside pulled him out, pulled him back into the house and shut the door. The men inside the house struck the men, young and old, at the door with blindness so that they could not find the door. The two men said, Do you have anyone else here who belongs to you? Sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so strong that he has sent us to destroy it. Yes, and thank you for taking us through that. Um, so what lessons are we learning from this, uh, this beautiful narrative that Jabari has read, which comes from Genesis 19? Very well delivered. Thank you so much. What lessons um, do you want us to pick from this story? Uh, yes. Um, this question will go to Misati. Lot hesitates before obeying the angel's command to leave Sodom. 
Is this true obedience? Explain. All right, so on this matter, I don't see this as true obedience because true obedience is exactly what Abraham did. That is, Abraham, when he was told, I want you to leave your people, I want you to leave your land, Abraham does not, in essence, put unbelief. With the Lord for him, he hesitated. He was like, really, are you sure? And I think this hesitation is further emphasized with the fact that his wife, his wife herself did not actually see Lot's urgency to the point that she was like, okay, how about I take a last look? Exactly. See? Exactly. Thank you, Jabari. Any other thing we should learn from this? Uh, okay, I have another question, which will go to teacher Bridget. If it is never wise to live close to people who are committing sin, what should Lot have done? So this whole problem began when Lot decided to choose to live near the city, actually within the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it is a lesson to us that when we're choosing where to put up, even later in life, because right now we're teens, we probably, it's our parents who probably chose where they want us to live. But even in future, as we are thinking of where we want to live, we need to consider what kind of neighbors we have. If you have a big basket full of bad apples and you only have one good apple, the truth is that one good apple is definitely going to become bad unless you remove that one, bad apple, one good apple from those bad apples. So it's a lesson to us, mingle with people who are pure so that you remain pure. Okay, this last question is for Marie. Why do you think it is that Lot's sons-in-law didn't believe him? Well, um, this week's scripture expresses the sad reality of so Sodom and Gomorrah and why God destroyed them. His sons probably said, um, nothing is gonna happen here. And you sound so funny with all that God talk. Well, I think that seeing the beautiful city and seeing how perfect it was for them, how comfortable it was for them to live there, they had nothing to, they had nothing to fear. They wouldn't think that God would destroy such a beautiful place. Absolutely. So how do you respond to God's appeal to you? I'd like to jump in right there and speak about my response to God's appeal. I, think I, f I feel at times that God is speaking to my conscience on certain matters. That is, when Christ calls us to be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect, I see such a perfection as continuously responding to <coughs> God's beckoning, in that God will pick some aspect in your life, make you uncomfortable, and then want you to learn something. And he won't stop until you learn that thing. In that, he will give you remedials until you pass the class. Thank you. And I'll ask Teacher Bridget to read Acts 28, 26, verse 25 to 29. Acts chapter 26, verse 26 to 29. It says, For the king knows of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Verse 27, King Ab Agrippa, do you believe that the prophet, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Verse 29, and Paul said, I wish to God that not only you, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and together such as I am, except these bones. Thank you. As you can see, King Agrippa was unsure. He was almost saved, but he hesitated. You can see this in Lot. He, his hesitation influenced his sons-in-law. They were almost saved, but they saw Lot's hesitation and were like, nah, it's not going to happen. So are there those things in life that you're, you know, God has called you to do, but you're almost there and you're not quite there? Ash? You know, sometimes we postpone our redemption for a later date. So what is that you're postponing? You know, you, you get convicted over something, you're like, um, I need to stop this. But you're like, no, I still like watching this, so I'm not really going to stop. Besides, I can still wait. I mean, I'm not dying today. I, I, I will get forgiven, I'll get saved, I'll stop this thing a bit later. And you notice this in King Agrippa, he said, you almost persuaded me, but wait until a later season. So he postponed his redemption. And you know, the Bible doesn't even record where he came.
came up and, you know, left the things of the world and decided to follow Christ. He postponed his redemption. We don't know whether he died the next day. Okay. We don't know. Thank you for that. What about you, Misati? So I want to jump in right then. I want to say that there's this aspect where the psalmist brings in presumptuous sin, in that we know that what we are doing is wrong, but then we see that God is this good, loving, compassionate Father, and we're like, God cannot destroy me. As in, it's so small. But of course, that's what Ellen White calls pet sins. See those pet sins, which are so hard for us to let go of exactly what bring us down. And at the same time, I think it also comes with us misunderstanding God. And I think that God wants us to actually express, to embrace freedom, that is, and to express our love for him by obeying his commandments. That's why Christ calls us to a more abundant life. Amen. So are there those things even on Sabbath, Friday night, Saturday, that you know you're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy, but you're almost keeping it holy? Yeah, so I'd like to just jump in right there. And I'd like to mention that that is the best matches usually happen on Sabbath. Oh. That is the EPL matches, of course, the best ones. Football, yeah. all the sports. Practically, and those actually are the most tantalizing matches, the derbies, etc. Right. Is... So you're, you know, you're caught up between, should yeah. I watch, should I keep should the I Sabbath not? day yeah. holy? So and you know, for people like us who are not into sports, we have our social media pages. Yeah. There are updates that are popping on your screen. And you're wondering, at that time you're in Vespers, and you're wondering, sh should I look, should I, should I text respond. back, should I respond, or should I just keep focusing? So, you know, such things. You're almost keeping the Sabbath, you're almost persuaded. But once or twice, you still find yourself in that setback where you're in Vespers, someone's reading the verse, and you're scrolling Instagram. So. Right, but this is no laughing matter. The warning is out and clear that, you know, when the Lord calls you to obey the command, you should. And you may not get the chance like Lot did, where the angels were dragging Lot and his family and they're kicking and screaming and taking all the time as they were getting out of the, you know, of the cities of destruction. So it is time for us to heed to the warning and not operate on the almost mode. How about we hear from Teacher Bridget on, you know, one of the beliefs we have as Seventh-day Adventists? Yes, absolutely. So in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have 28 fundamental beliefs. These beliefs are wholly based on the Bible, and they help us understand, as Seventh-day Adventists, what and why do we really believe what we believe? So from today's lesson, our fundamental belief is number 11, growing in Christ. Now, the thing is, if you think about it, right from when you were born, you were really, really tiny. But day by day, moment by moment, you continued gaining height, length, width, right? So in the same way, just as God is interested in our physical growth, he's much more interested in our spiritual growth. And we're given three main pointers on how to grow spiritually. Number one is prayer, consistent prayer. Constant, consistent prayer. Number two is Bible study, private Bible study and public Bible study, even as we are doing today. And the last one is communing with other believers so that you continue growing and don't remain stagnant. Amen. So let us please respond to God's appeal to us and really grow in Christ. Would like um, Ashley to take us through the Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and this comes from the background of what were the sins of Sodom. The greater sins of Sodom, you know, they heeded not the invitation of repentance. And what is the invitation of repentance? You know, those things you get convicted of in your conscience when no one is preaching, but you toss them aside and you're like, not so important. I mean, it's part of life. It's part of life. Those who profess to know Christ but deny him in their character and their daily lives. If someone were to look at me today or look at you, would they think, know for a fact that you are a Christian and you Reveal Christ both in your character and your daily life. Or when, when, when you first decided to be an Adventist or to come to church, 
Was there this zeal that you don't have today? Mm -hmm. You know, such questions we need to ask ourselves. And at times we take matters of salvation as trifles and light that they all, but they all have an eternal consequence. What we do today, what we do now, may not seem like has a lasting impression. Like, I mean, just for this moment and now, but all these things have an eternal consequence and all these things weigh in the balances. Like, you know, the little things that you do here and now matter. Those habits you build today will be there with you for the rest of your lives. And you know, sometimes truth is unsettling. But the fact that the truth is unsettling and it's not comfortable does not change the truth. It's not changed by our discomfort or comfort. Wow. It is just truth. It is just plain. Whether it is leave Sodom and go. Just imagine today I were to wake up and say, Misati, you're leaving home. You're leaving your everything, your pets, your mom, your dad. And that's what God has called you to do. Would you do it? I think, you know, I would want to test God. You see, the way Gideon tested God and he asked him that if this thing, as he put a fleece right there outside and he said, if this fleece is wet and the ground is dry, okay, then if this fleece is dry and the ground is wet, then okay. Mm -hmm. I would want to test God the same way to be sure. It is God. It is God. Exactly. And, yeah. So, you know, truth is not changed. But if, if, if we are called today to live behind our parents, our everything and follow that which God has for us would definitely be hesitant. That's true. Because you, 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 we, we most of the time say, you know, Lot's wife was not obedient, she looks back. But think about it this way, you have children and they're in the city and the city is going to burn. How dare you not look back? Yes, but that's why God says it's no laughing matter. Today he calls you and I to make a decision to follow Christ. And he has given us so many warnings and he's not going to rest. He's not going to give up. He's not going to say, well, you know, my people, you know, they'll perish. He is constantly seeking us and, and giving us the knowledge we need to just turn to him and follow Christ. Yeah, so it's, it's no laughing matter. We should, we should take it very seriously. We should not turn back like Lot's wife did. And we should not hesitate like Lot's did. And it also calls for us then to... As we deliver the news to others, we also should deliver it with seriousness so that others may listen and actually follow. So thank you so much for that. We would now like to um, get into uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. I'll read Matthew 25, verse 40. Okay. It says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it, Unto, of, unto one of the least of these of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Amen. Amen. Yes, Jabari, would you please take us to the Wednesday part? Okay. One of the few bright spots in the story of Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah is the theme of hospitality. Do you think Lot knew who his two mysterious guests were when he first invited them to his home? No. Is it wise today to invite total strangers to your home. In many cultures, the form of hospitality showed by Lot is expected of all the people. Read the punchlines. Let's go through the punchlines and see which one each of us strikes the most. Okay, so even as we go through the punchlines, Jabari, how about we answer the fact that, um, you know, what's your response to the fact that do you think that Lot knew who these mysterious guests were? No. No? He did not know. But I think he learned from Abraham. Because if you read the previous story, Abraham met this same man afar off. Mm -hmm. He did not know whether they were God. He did not know. But having lived with Abraham, he knew. Like for the Jews and the Arabs, even today, Meeting a stranger and giving them a cup of water is part of their culture. tradition and culture. Mm -hmm. So he might have just learned from Abraham. And also, the Bible records that it was dusk, it was evening, mm -hmm. when this man came into the city, knowing the area in which he lived, knowing how those people, look at how they wanted to deal with him at the door because he was not letting them out. 
So he also knew that he does not live in a safe place, so it would be necessary that this man come in. Okay, you wanted to say something, Misati? And I think the thing is that with Lot, for him, he felt the need to protect this man. Because mm -hmm. I think he had even seen himself firsthand what had happened to men who went into that city. And then they stayed in the streets. And it's interesting the way the Bible puts it, that all men, young and old. In an, I'm, I'm imagining in my head that there was a 15-year-old guy yeah. who was there to see this man. Right. At the same time, I'm imagining there was someone as old as, say, my grandfather there. Mm -hmm trying to see this man to see what is this that has come to, what are, what is this that has come into the city and what can i benefit from this exactly but in this case a uh, lot is hospitable even his position at the gates you know he's he's like us standing you know outside the gate in church and inviting anybody and everybody to actually come in so that they worship with us yeah yes teacher bridget i'm afraid that um, that spirit of hospitality has really died down in this day and age. Yes. Because you realize that there's a lot of trickery. So you're, you're not sure if I invite this person, is it a genuine person? Exactly. Will they come and, you know, rob me of my property? So it is a bit of a challenge. However, we are advised in the Bible that, you know, when you admit strangers into your house, you might find that you've admitted angels exactly. into your house. Mm. Exactly. So um, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were known to have the sin of lack of hospitality. So today, uh, uh, can we be caught up in that sin? Or are we caught up in that sin? I think teacher Bridget has said very well. How about in the church? What can we do as teenagers in the church to ensure we are hospitable? So one thing that truly we can do, time and time again, every Sabbath, we get new members, people yes. who have never been to our church, people who might not even be Adventists. So as teenagers, it is our responsibility to make sure that they feel hospitable, they feel at home and they're welcome and we encourage them, you know, finding out during the week, how are you doing? How was your week? Here is the lesson. Kindly, can you study it? Let's see you next Sabbath. So th those are some of the ways we can Amen. Maria, I thought you'd talk about the Teens Togetherness yeah, Sabbath. I was going to. Okay. Like when we had Teens Togetherness Sabbath, um, after that, I saw new faces coming consistently right. and people making friends with them, which Amen. encouraged them to stay as well. It's like good peer pressure. Wow. Yeah, and yeah, um, yesterday <coughs> night I met, I met Nakomita in the supermarket and he said to me that, you know, so many people after the togetherness are consistent because wow. they are hoping for another togetherness where they get to meet so many people and many other teens who are in this and struggling together with them. So it was something that was really good. Amen. So back again to our title, No Laughing Matter. We are called upon to ensure we, you know, encourage people to join the kingdom, you know. So let's, let's look forward to being more hospitable so that we can encourage more teens and more people to love the church. All right, so Jabari was taking us through the punchlines and really telling us which verse speaks to him, you know, the most. Okay, for me, it would be Leviticus 19.34. The foreigner residing among, among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. All right, so why does this speak to you? Uh, because sometimes, as human beings, we treat people differently, as if we don't share anything in common with mm. them. Wow, okay. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else? Which verse speaks to you, Misati? So the verse that speaks to me, and I believe that summarizes a lot of what the ethos of our lesson is, mm -hmm. is Romans 12, 22, where we are being called not to be conformed to this world, but to be changed by the renewing of our minds. In that, mm -hmm. we want God to do a neurosurgery mm -hmm. on our minds in order for us to think different mm -hmm. and thus be different. Amen, amen. What about you, Marie? Well, I like Hebrews um, 13, verse 2. So it says, Do not forget to show hospi hospitality to the strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. I know, like, sometimes when we get 
a visitor, like a random visitor, I would wonder, why are they coming to our house? But as my African mother does, she will treat them so well, like better than she treats us on some days. <laughs> you know? And I was just, I wonder, but sometimes it's good. It pays off. It, pays it really off. does sometimes something. Sometimes you're, you're told to move mm -hmm. from your room and your bed. Yeah. And inconvenience. Yeah. Thank God for your mother. Thank God. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Ashley? Um, that would be Colossians 3.1. Set right. your mind on things above. You know, where yeah. your mind is is where your heart is. Mm -hmm. Lord's heart was in Sodom. Yes. And how do we at times as teenagers pitch our tents mm. towards Sodom? Where do we put our mind? Mm -hmm. so, so Lot was indeed a righteous person, but the choices he made, you know, messed him up because he decided to live near Sodom and also associate with the wrong people. And that did affect his, you know, his thinking, his actions were not as fast and quick. He even actually had to be given more grace to rest in one of the cities before they were destroyed. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Teacher Bridget, would you like to also mention about a verse that speaks to you? Yes, absolutely. Just like Misati, it's Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, yes. that we should not conform mm -hmm. to the things of this world. Mm -hmm. And clearly we've seen in Lot's story that he actually almost conformed. He almost conformed. And the question that God is asking us today is, um, you know, as, as it was in the times of Lot, that the sites of Sodom and Gomorrah were too good for them to live. Yeah? What is preventing you from seeing God and from experiencing God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a rhetorical question. You can think about it. But what is making you feel like you want to conform and not to take part in God's, God's work? Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, we would like to invite Ashley to please um, tell us what the Spirit of Prophecy says in this lesson. The Spirit of Prophecy directs us to the story of Lot. When he <coughs> went outside the door and said to this man, I have two daughters. You see, Lot was willing to sacrifice his two daughters for the sake of this man. And it talks about sexual immorality and it takes us to the story of Bathsheba and David mm -hmm. and Uriah. In Second Samuel? In Second chapter... Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. Yes. And I'd like to read verse 3, which says, So David sent and inquired, sorry, from verse 2, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and Simon said, Is this not but Sheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Mm -hmm. What was David doing? He was walking on his roof one evening. What is the scene of Sodom? Fullness of bread and idleness. Exactly. What idleness was David doing? Is a big sin. Mm. David was idle. That is why he was walking exactly. in the evening on the roof. Mm -hmm. Remember at this time, the Israelites were at war. As a king, where should he have been? At war. At war. Mm -hmm. But where was he? Idle. In the roof? In the roof, walking. <laughs> walking. You know, that does not el eliminate the fact that we also need time to sit down, relax, meditate, go walking. Don't walk on the roof, walk on the ground. <laughs> walk I think on the that ground. would be safer. <laughs> yes. But idleness, that is how he got himself into this sin, which he later, which was ever before him. And later he said, My sin is ever before me, mm. creating me a clean heart creating me a pure, right spirit within me that I may not sin against you. Because of all the sins that we could ever commit, this is one sin that we commit to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And even as much as you'd think, well, I made this mistake and it's behind me, it's not like stealing where you'd steal. You stole something, you returned it, you got forgiven, it's out of you. And sexual sin is the one you, you know, sin it against your own body. always be in your memory mm -hmm. always no matter what you do unless God creates creating me a clean, a clean heart, heart and renew a right spirit within, within me. me that is the only way of erasing these things so 
of all the sins, this is the, I would not say the most grievous, but it's the sin that would affect the most. Okay. And I'd like to jump in right there. With this perverted, they were not virgins. They could not have been virgins. Mm -hmm. And for that very reason, it's a lot new, no better. So the men were scoffing at him. Hey, kumbe ujui, kumbi ujuangi. Like, you don't know what your daughters are doing behind your back. And so for that reason, they were like, I, we are not interested with, I, I refrain to use that word. Yes. We're not interested in your daughters, that is. Yes, the choice of where Lot lived really contributed to all this, you know. So the daughters then indulged in, you know, the, the wrong things. Yeah, so that does matter. So how about as young people, as teens, what ways can you ensure you remain sexually pure? What advice can you give others? How do you remain sexually pure, Marie? Well, I think you shouldn't be idle because yeah. as that's what happens, that's what the case was in most of these Bible stories. So always be busy with something, something good. Right. Yeah. Idle mind takes you to those websites that you're not supposed to go to. An idle devil's mind workshop. is a devil's workshop. The yeah. idle mind is a devil's workshop. What other ways can you ensure as a young man you keep your way pure? Psalms 119 verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? Um, Jabari. Yes. And as Jabari is getting it, we can also hear from... From you, Misati, which other ways can you keep your way pure? I believe that is like uh, Job speaks very emphatically on this, and mm -hmm. he says that I have made a covenant with my eyes. I shall then, why then shall I look lustfully upon a maiden? Amen. Then David underscores that that I shall set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that go astray. Mm. It shall not cleave to me. So what I would infer from this is just avoiding any situation that would actually bring compromising thoughts, affections, feelings, and behaviors. Amen. Yeah. And you know, and in the world where we live today, yes, it comes from the people you least expect. Someone mm. you think has the same standard with you may not necessarily do so. Mm -hmm. So it, is, it may be awkward, it is awkward at times, but it is very important that you state your stand. Amen. Yeah, Amen. and no further. Amen. No laughing matter. Warn them. Yes, Jabari. Uh, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Amen. So we must spend time soaked, like Teacher Bridget said, in the word of God. That is the only way you're going to keep yourself pure. Yes, Teacher Bridget. I'd also like to add that accountability with mm -hmm. each other is a very important aspect in remaining sexually pure. Yes. Have friends who will hold you accountable. What were you doing? Why didn't you come to church last Sabbath? Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Have you been studying your lesson? And the second and last thing I'd like to say is guard your senses, as Misati said. Yes. Guard your eyes. Guard your ears. Guard even what comes out of your mouth. Exactly. Because that way, in that way, then you're going to um, learn how to be sexually pure. Absolutely. God actually had to save Lot by grabbing him in. And then what did he do with the people outside? Blind their eyes. He blinded them. So your eyes, your eyes are powerful things. Eh? Yeah. So let's, let's guard ourselves and guard ourselves indeed from all this sexual immorality. Now, we'd like to ask teacher Bridget um, to take us through the last section. Yes. So one thing that is quite profound from our lesson today is that God will fight and fight and fight again until he gets you. Amen. He will not stop. He will not stop. And we're learning that time and time again, um, destruction will not let us go until we all have an opportunity to be saved. Mm. So we have a few verses to read just before we conclude. So Misati, you'll take us through Luke chapter 21 verse 20 and 21. And then Marie, get ready with Revelations, chapter 17, verse 18. Jabari, you'll get ready with Revelation, chapter 18, verse 4. And Ashley, you'll get ready with Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. So let's just get there and see how God is really struggling to ensure that we remain in the fold. Yeah, so let me jump in with Luke 21, verse 20 and 21. And these are the words of the Christ. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, 
you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. Mm. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18 states, The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. And Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mama. Mm -hmm. Barry? And another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Amen. So from these verses, we get to see that our Lord, even in this day and age, he is warning us. There's a distraction that is looming. Mm -hmm. We ought to come out of Babylon. We ought to forsake our sins or else distraction will come upon us. Remember that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. So at this time, it is our time to separate ourselves from the sin, or else the sinner will have to be destroyed with the sin. May the Lord bless you, and we'd like to invite Jabari to do the closing prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Now as we are about to conclude our discussion, May we understand and internalize everything we've discussed and may we live by what we've talked about. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.